times, but every day praising you feels fulfilling because you fulfill our hearts and you fulfill our minds, souls, and spirits every single day. Lord, you are Jehovah Jireh. You are our provider. Yep. Lord, provide for those who do and provide for those who don't. Lord, we praise you in the day and we praise you in the night. Lord, we praise you from the moment we wake up and we praise you from the moment we lay our heads to fall asleep, Lord. Lord, bless Pastor Darby's sermon. Bless the words that are in there. And Lord, bless the message that is going to be given, Father. Amen. 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 We thank you, Lord. Thank you, CJ. Hallelujah. Can we give a praise to the Lord? Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It's always good to be in the house of the Lord. It's always good to be together praising, especially after a rough week. I don't know if you had a rough week, but we all, I'm sure, have had some sort of a rough week. And you know what happens when you have a rough week? It zaps that energy out of you. You know, it's kind of like a beat down. You know, it's like on a hot day. I don't know if you've ever been to Georgia on a hot, hot day. That sun comes beating down on you, and then that sun hits your skin, and it starts sizzling your skin. And when you get back into that AC place you're going to, whether a hotel or home or whatever, it just zaps the energy out of you because that heat was just beating down on you. And sometimes those are our worries. And we rest in the Lord. We give our worries to the Lord. That CJ uh, mentioned. We trust the Lord. And we have faith that tomorrow's another day. And yes, we may have worries today, but tomorrow is a new day. And we have to promise that there's a new day. Therefore, he's going to get us there. And that's who we depend on. And we thank the Lord for that. We should be always graceful. Praise the Lord. So for this um, sermon um, today, we're going to continue the series of being relational, being rooted in Christ. And if you're going to be with like-minded individuals, first of all, you have to understand your identity. Remember, I told you guys last week, we're under witness protection. Now we're no longer our old selves. We are new selves, new creatures. So now you got to explore and get to see who is this new person. It's funny because I was um, watching a TV program with my wife the other day, and it's called Scandal. And we we're binge watching it because it's an old show, but now it's new to us. <laughs> and we we're watching it, and there was one person they were trying to hide out, and they're changing their identity. And they're telling the person, you got to get to know this identity because when they ask you questions in immigration in the other place, you got to act like this is you. So this is the same way with us. We're not acting. We're getting to know our identity in Christ in order to communicate Christ to others. So we have to be prepared to live out our identity in Christ. So we're going to go straight into the message. So our identity in Christ is one of newness. So I don't know about you. I know I love the smell of newness, whether it be new furniture, whether it be new sneakers, whether it be a new iPad. There's something about when you're opening something new, that it's overjoyed, like, wow, it's mine. Nobody else had it. It's for me, you know? So for us, the newness is we're new in Christ, and we should be overjoyed about that because that means the old you doesn't matter. The old you was in prison, doesn't matter, not to the Lord. To the Lord, he does not recall that because you are forgiven. You are free in him. So one of the things we see is that identity is defined as the collective aspect of the set of characteristics by which a thing is definitely recognizable. So for example, if somebody tells you a rose is a rose, how do you recognize it? First of all, by its color, by its thorns, its stem. So it's easily recognizable. Most of us growing up knew what a rose was. So the same way, most people know who a Christian is, what a Christian should look like, how they should act. Are we perfect? No, we are not. There are going to be moments we're going to be caught out, out of character. So, in the case of our identity in Christ, our lives should indicate we are the same as Christ. The name Christians means literally followers of Christ. So, if we go to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 17 and 18. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 17 and 18. And I'm going to read it in the English Standard Version, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And it reads as follows. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. 
So looking at those verses, that's theology. Remember, this is Paul who's writing. This is why we're studying Paul on Fridays when we do our live stream, the theology of Paul. Paul is speaking theology, the study of God. And what he's saying here is, if you're in Christ, you can't act the way you did before. You're a new creature now. He says the old passed away. Now, this doesn't mean that the old you won't creep up. This means that you're sealed by the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit guides you to be more holy. But can we resist the Holy Spirit? Yes, we can. And this is why we have to be prayed up. This is why we have to fellowship, gather with like-minded individuals, so we're not taken out of character. Remember, we're a new character, which is our identity in Christ. But the old character is still there. We just don't want that old character out. We're buried that old character. When you get baptized in the waters, what you're saying publicly to the world is that I'm burying my old self, and the person who parted through those waters is a new person. I'm not going to act like that person anymore. But some of us be carrying our shovels. Somebody step on our toes, we're already digging the old person out and be like, yo, take care of this because, you know, this is your job. No, we need to present it to the Lord. We're new creatures. So we also see in verse 18, it says, all this is from God who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Don't you know you're in ministry as soon as you come to the Lord? Your ministry is to introduce Christ to someone else, especially by how you carry yourself. Someone who knew you in the past might run into you and say, why you're so, you look so joyous, you look so calm. I ran into somebody a couple of days ago and I was joking with my wife and a couple of friends. The person saw me in the elevator here in Co-op City and I haven't seen this person maybe two, three years. And the person looked at me and says, Man, you age well. You look good. And I looked at him. I said, dude, I feel like crap. <laughs> I'm like, I feel horrendous. My body's aching and everything. He says, but you look good, man. You look like you're happy. And I'm like, well, that's Christ. Praise the Lord, you know. And the person is a fellow believer. So praise the Lord. That Then what you see in me is Christ. And that's what we have to keep in mind. So as a believer, we don't just feel like a new creation. We have to act out like a new creation. So if we see in Genesis chapter 1, it says that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. But the earth became formless and void when Lucifer was cast out of heaven. So God spoke a recreation into its being, the earth. And this is similar with us. We were born into this world. We're God's creatures. But we became formless and without void. Why? Because sin introduced into the earth. So as we strayed from the Lord, and as some of you have been reading with us through the Old Testament, reading the Bible in a year, you see that the people of Israel at times strayed from the Lord to the point that there were generations that were void, meaning that they had no signs that they looked like they were God's creatures. And that's a problem. Because if you call yourself a follower of the Lord, you should look at it. There should be evidence of it. So what we needed was the blood of Christ to reform us. So we see that um, when we choose to submit to Satan, our personality is voided out, is wiped out. We start doing the things that the enemy wants us to do. But when we're made new in the Lord, we start doing what God wants us to do. And that goes back to what we said. Our identity, once we recognize our identity, it produces a faith. That produces obedience, which produces action. We take steps doing things of God. Remember, if we're in the ministry of reconciliation, as Paul mentions, that means we're called to reunite people to Christ. But it starts with us first. They have to see the Christ in us first. So one of the things that the ministry of reconciliation requires is sacrifice. One of the hardest things for human beings to do is give up their time. Let's be real. You know, we have busy lives, especially in New York. You know, New York is the land of hurry, hurry. Don't be getting, don't be a tourist in New York walking in Manhattan and get in the way of a local. They will push you out the way. Don't be looking around like on 50th Street and 5th Avenue and be like, oh, look at the Trump building, look at this. Somebody will just elbow you like they don't care. Get out my way. I got places to go. They won't hold the door for the train. They'll be like, you didn't make it, that's your problem. That's yeah. not my problem, that's a new problem. <laughs> you know, they close the doors on you, you know? And that's sad, because that shouldn't be our identity. Once in a while you hear a news report that someone breaks out of that mold. 
that if someone is getting hurt, someone's getting robbed, someone in New York actually has a heart still and responds, but that's rare, okay? So in our new identity in Christ, we're no longer slaves to sin. So we're going to go to Romans 6, verses 6 through 8. The key verse is going to be verse 6. So we're reconciled to God. In verse 6, it says, we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the sinful body might be destroyed and we might no longer be enslaved to sin. For he who has died is fled from sin. But if we have died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. So again, if you call yourself a follower of Christ, there has to be evidence of that. The burial of your old self. You can't be one person and then another. You can't walk on two sides of the street. You can't have your cake and eat it too. You have to decide who are you following. If you're not following Christ, you're following the enemy. You are choosing a side. People don't realize that, especially people in the world. You are choosing a side. It's not like, oh, I want to be neutral. There's no such thing as neutral in the Lord. Is either you with him or you're without him. Simple as that. You're rejecting him or you're accepting him. So one of the things we see in that, and I put it in the Revised Standard Version, how it describes, we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the sinful body might be destroyed. In certain translations, it doesn't say that word destroy. But in the original translation, the Greek word was katahego, which means destroy, which means alienated, but also means paralyzed. So what does this mean? It means you got to be able to take the power away from this body. Remember, the flesh is weak, but the spirit is strong. So we can't submit to this flesh. Once we came to the Lord, we trust the Holy Spirit. We give ourselves to the Lord to be able to control this flesh. Because if you leave it to the flesh, you'll be doing things to the flesh. Okay? So we're no longer enslaved to sin. Now, Paul means that does not mean that believers no longer sin, but that Christ's death and resurrection have freed them from the rule of sin. Believers are now called used to use their freedom to pursue righteousness. So you have a choice in your freedom in Christ. Do good, do the work of the Lord, or don't do the work of the Lord. But know this, once you testify that you serve the Lord, if you're not doing things of God, you're messing up his name, not just your name, his name, his testimony. So we have to be mindful of that. And that's part of the part that causes church hurt. This is why people end up leaving churches and they blame God and it's not God's fault. It's man's fault because they chose to be disobedient. It's not the church's fault. It's man's fault. We have to understand the church is a hospital filled with people that are struggling with sin. So don't think that just coming to the hospital, you're going to get healthy. How many of you ever been to the hospital and come out worse than you went in? Yeah. You know? You know how many viruses are in the hospital? It's funny because when my mom ended up in the hospital recently, my cousin came in and she came in with a mask and everything. And I'm like, I'm in there without a mask. I'm like, I trust the Lord, whatever, you know. And she's coming in there with a mask and everything. She said, no, nah, but you know, you come in here and you come out sicker. And, and I'm like, I understand that. I said, but you know, I trust the Lord. There's been times I've been in the hospital even with a mask and still get sick, you know? There was times during the pandemic, I had a mask the whole time. I still ended up catching COVID and it was towards the end when they were like, oh, COVID is over. And as soon as they said that, that's when I got it. As soon as they said COVID was over, I was like, yeah, I guess it's not over because I got it, you know? So these are things we have to be mindful of. So we also see that we're the image bearers of God. So in that phrase is found several times, both in the book of Genesis in the Old Testament and we see it in the New Testament. And it means that humankind is separate from the animal and planet kingdom. Remember, in Genesis, we were created not just to worship, but to take care of the land. We were created to be stewards. So for those people that think, oh, the only reason we work is because sin introduced into the world. I remember I had a conversation with a fellow believer. He said that. He says, man, I hate this world. I'm like, well, why do you hate this world? He says, because we have to work. And I'm tired of working. And I'm looking at him like, really? And why are you tired of working? He goes, all because of Adam and Eve. Now we have to work. I said, hold up. I said, let's go back. I said, go open the Bible. Because I tell you guys, I'll be like, let's go in the Bible. Show me where that says that. And we went back and I said, okay, show me where. Because in the beginning, Adam had a job. You know what was his job? Name the animals. He had a job. And then he had to take care of those animals. So that was before sin was even introduced. So we always were called to work. 
by faith we do the work of God. So once he saw that, I was like, okay, so do you have an excuse not to be in church now? No. I said, so I'm guessing I'm seeing you next Sunday, right? Yeah. Kind of figured. See? So we have to go to the evidence of the Bible, you know? Sometimes we just make excuses because we don't want to do the things of the Lord because we want to do our own thing. Mm -hmm. Also, we tend to, like, try to blame other people for our mistakes. We don't want to take ownership of our mistakes, okay? So if we go to Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 through 28, it reads as follows in the New International Version. Then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness. Uh, Genesis 1, 26. So that they may rule over the fish in the sea and birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. So what we see in those verses, we were given authority by the Lord. We were given a job description right there. I don't know how many of you ever apply for a job, and sometimes they don't tell you what, what your main job will be, right? I'm the kind of person, you know what, I want to see it in paper. Give me my job description, so whenever they try to say, oh, that's part of your job description. Uh-uh, that wasn't what you gave me here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now they're slick. Now you have jobs that be like, oh, this, you, this and this, plus whatever additional duties. Yes. <laughs> so that's the way they cover themselves. They were like, oh, it's in your job description. It's called additional duties. So and you'd be like, I'm called here to be uh, folding t-shirts in Walmart and additional duties, go clean the toilet. And you're like, but it's not my additional duties. There you go. So this is what we have to be aware of. Here we see our job description. We were called to maintain this earth. We were called to be stewards. And this is in practice for when we get to heaven that we're going to be worshiping with the Lord at all times. We see in Genesis chapter 2 verse 15 it says, the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. There you go. We were called to work for his glory. We see in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, it says, Therefore, if anyone's in Christ, the new creation has come, the old has gone, the new is here. So with your new identity, you get a new title. What's the new title? Serving in Christ. There's a key word there, servant, meaning we're called to serve. Some of us don't like the idea of that. Some of us like the idea of people serving us. We are called to serve. We should be ready to serve. I shared with you guys, once you're part of this church, you're saying I'm ready to serve at any moment. You need something. If you have that talent and skill set, then you're willing to use that talent and skill set. For example, Sister Jenny right now is going to actually do something for um, the women's ministry in Circle of Christ Church. She was willing to serve. Praise the Lord. She volunteered. Amen, amen. So that's what we're called to do. Not just the local body, but the universal body in church. Because she's helping another church. She's blessing them with her talents. That's what we're called to do. This, this is not a spirit of competition. This is the spirit of we're all one body in Christ. One church. Okay? So one thing we have to see is how faith leads to obedience. If you don't recall how you experienced it, as soon as you accepted Jesus Christ, Lord and Savior, it's by faith you're saved. The next thing that you desire is to grow a relationship. You want to know who you're going to serve. So you want to get an idea so someone will teach you how to read the Word of God so you can get to know Jesus and so forth. So that faith is now producing obedience to seek God, and then that obedience helps you to follow the Word of God and fall in line with the Word of God, and then that helps you come to serve Him fully in that action, okay? So believing that Jesus is God incarnate who died on the cross to pay penalty for our sins and was resurrected is not enough. Even the demons believe in God and acknowledge those facts, and we're going to see that in James 2.19. We must personally and fully rely on the death of Christ as the atoning sacrifice for our sins. That means, once saved, don't be trying to take your salvation out of God's hand. And we tend to do that. How do we do that? By turning away from Him. Because therefore, if you constantly turn away from the Lord, are you truly saved? You have to ask yourself. 
Because if you're constantly rebelling against God, then you're not submitting to God. And if you're not submitting to God, are you truly saved? Are you truly a Christian? Or are you pretending to be a Christian for the benefits? And there are a lot of people that do that. They come to church for the benefits. I remember a young sister who wanted to be a well-known um, singer. And she was worshiping in different churches. So she was church hopping and church shopping. But which one had the great worship team? So like that she could be part of it. Which church was making albums so she could be part of it? And you know, that's a big business now. You have Elevation Church, which is not a Christian church. I'm telling you right now, it is not a Christian church. I'll repeat it again. Elevation is not a Christian church, just in case you can get it the first two times. And they have a great worship. They do have great singers and so forth. But you have to be careful who you listen to. Look at the lyrics. A lot of their theology is off. So you have to be mindful of that. Okay? So there's people that see Christians as a market. So just because they call themselves a Christian, you got to look. Is there evidence of their identity there? So the biblical definition of faith does not apply only to salvation. It also applies to the rest of the Christian life. We are to believe what the Bible says. We are to obey it. We are to believe the promises of God and we are to live according to it. So does the Bible change? It does not. So that means the word of God doesn't change, right? But we change in terms of our theology. And we're not supposed to. So for example, let's say me and my wife in the Lord, 22 years, all of a sudden we have a child. Our child grows up. And our child decides to decide that their identity is the homosexual lifestyle. Should my theology change? Did God's word change? No, it did not. What does the word say about homosexuality? That act is a sin. Meaning, if you do something repetitively that's against the will of God, it's sinning. It's habitual sin. So should I say, that's okay, that my child is living that lifestyle? I should be disappointed naturally because it's breaking the word of God. I should pray for my child. I do not reject my child. I still love on them. But that doesn't change my theology as a pastor. I shouldn't say, okay, so we're going to marry homosexual couples here because my son is homosexual. So now we're changing our theology and we're going to marry anybody who's same-sex relationships. No, it should not change. I should not be doing that. I should not be compromising the testimony of Christ. And we see people doing that. And it's a shame. It's a loss. Just because someone in your family decides that that's the lifestyle they want to live should not change your views in the Word of God. The Word of God does not change. It's still the same. And we see a lot of churches changing. We see denominations, whole denominations changing in that aspect. So we see in James chapter 2, verses 18 through 23, the evidence of change. Starting 18. But someone will say, you have faith, and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that God is one. You do well. Even the demons believe and shudder. Do you want to be shown, you foolish person, that faith apart from works is useless? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up his son Isaac on the altar? You see that faith was not active along with his works. And faith was completed by his works. And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. And he was called friend of God. So imagine, this is in verse 18. It's speaking about an imaginary person, someone introduced, who objects to James' conclusion, his correction. So James is the brother of Jesus Christ. And he's writing this letter of correction. And he's basically arguing with others of faith, saying, yeah, he, he agrees. Faith doesn't, a work doesn't save you. By faith, you're saved. But the work is the evidence of your faith. So they go hand in hand. If there's faith and there's no work, is there truly faith? So he starts going back into theology. He goes into the Old Testament. He goes into Abraham. Abraham, by faith, made a move. God called them. He says, if you go to this strange place, I'm going to give you this land, and many are going to come out of your generation. By faith, blind faith, he went and followed what God said. But you know where his action took place was when God said, I want you to go to the altar and take your son and put him on the altar as a sacrifice. 
He wanted to see if he was willing to be obedient. Now, mind you, if you read the whole word of God, God never required a human sacrifice ever. But by faith, Abraham continued and he took him up and prepared him at the altar. Now, this is the kind of faith Abraham had. If God is God, and God required him to sacrifice his son. Could he not resurrect his son after he sacrificed him? Yes. So that's the cosmo vision that Abraham had. He says, I trust the Lord because if the Lord made me, he gave me my son. Therefore, me giving him back, that's understanding that your children are temporary. They are loaned to you. It's the same way with Job. Job, when he went through his struggles and he lost his children, they weren't technically lost. They were in the Lord. So he will see them again. And then he gained more children. So this is what we're seeing, that everything is temporary. But our faith produces action. So by faith, he was going to sacrifice his son, but the Lord did not allow it and saw his faith and his action. And therefore, he was rewarded righteousness. He was recognized he was righteous. So we see it's not faith in works that saves a man. It's not faith or works. It's faith that works. All Abraham was doing on Mount Mora was showing the reality of what had taken place in his life years earlier when he simply believed God. If your faith is real, it will show itself. There will be evidence of your faith. Okay? If we go to Acts chapter 8, verses 26 through 38. And this is another example of faith producing action. Acts chapter 8, verses 26 through 38. And we're going to read it in the New International Version. And let me know when you guys are there, because these are a couple verses. We praise the Lord. Give me a nice hearty amen once you guys have it. Oh, that wasn't hearty. You guys need some Wheaties. <laughs> Do you guys have it? Oh, my God. Maybe some Spanish food. we got to get rid of the weeds. <laughs> so we read this in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Verse 26. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, go south to the road, desert road, that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he started out on his way. He met an Ethiopian eunuch, meaning part of uh, Sudan. Today it was considered Sudan. An important official in charge of all the treasury of the Kandike which means queen of the Ethiopians. This man had gone to Jerusalem to worship and on his way home was sitting in his chariot, reading the book of Isaiah the prophet. The Holy Spirit told Philip, go to that chariot and stay near it. Then Philip ran up to the chariot and heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet. Do you understand what you're reading? Philip asked. How can I, he said, unless someone explains it to me. So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. And this is the passage of scripture the eunuch was reading. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter, and as a lamb before its shear is silent. So he did not open his mouth. In his humiliation, he was deprived of justice. Who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from the earth. The eunuch asked Philip, tell me please, who is the prophet talking about, himself or someone else? Then Philip began with that very passage of scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. As they traveled along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, Look, here is water. What can stand in the way of me being baptized? And he gave the orders to stop the chariot. Then both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and Philip baptized them. Praise the Lord. So several things we see going on here. First of all, if you read the passages before, the, through the Holy Spirit, Philip was moved from where he was evangelizing at which was a multiple amount of people to minister to one person. One thing we have to understand is sometimes we fall in love with ministry when it feels like we're being lifted up. The person who needs to be lifted up is Christ. So for example, sometimes we look at numbers. Right now we have small numbers here today, but sometimes we'll look at the empty seats and complain, no, you guys were called to listen to the word God here and whoever listens to it online. Those were the people that the Lord is going to bless listening to this message. Mm -hmm. But sometimes as human beings, we're like, wow. You know, if we're, we're preaching to, let's say, 200 people, and then the Lord through the Holy Spirit tells us, I need you to preach to this one person. You don't want to leave the 200 because you're saying, oh, but I could, I could do so much good with all these people. 
does not matter. It's God who directs us. He's the one that gives the marching orders. We're soldiers for Christ. We obey. And that's what Philip did. And Philip was taken through the power of the Holy Spirit from where he was evangelizing to several members of the body and taken to minister to one person. And this is how God can use us. There might be one person who's reading the word of God and cannot understand it. And whatever little you know, you might be able to enlighten someone, educate someone, disciple someone. So this is what we see Philip doing with the eunuch. The other thing we see here is that the Lord was already working in the eunuch. He was traveling from Israel. That means he's made the trip several times. That means he's heard the word several times to the point that he was a follower of the Lord, not of Christ, because he didn't know Christ yet. But Christ was already crucified and ascended. But he had a scroll, meaning a portion of the Old Testament of the book of Isaiah. And he's trying to understand it. As believers, when you first come to Christ, you're going to have to keep trying to read the word of God. And trust in the Holy Spirit that he will help you understand it. Are you going to get the words right away? No, you are not. I was just in some family member's house. They've been reading through the word of God together. Praise the Lord. And they had questions. And they were comfortable enough to ask me. And I was able to answer them. And we had a discussion about the word of God. And I was joyous at the fact that we could have a discussion about the word of God. And that's the way it should be. So we see here, after he has explanation, after he has the uh, understanding, after he's taught theology by Philip to the eunuch, what is eunuch's faith doing now? Now he's observing and he demands action. Meaning, now he knows who Jesus is, who died for him. And the next step is he wants to be baptized in the waters. And what does he do? They're walking back, going by a, land, a body of water, and he says, that's good enough. Can we, can we get baptized right here? And what does Philip say? Yes, we can. We can do it right here. One of the things that churches do badly at times is that we wait to baptize someone. Someone may be interested in getting baptized in the waters because they want to be a new creature and they want to do everything for Christ. And we'll add stipulations to that baptism. You have to take a special class to be baptized. You have to wait six months to be baptized so we can make sure you're truly a Christian. Mm -hmm. The Bible doesn't say any of that. The Bible says once you accept Jesus Christ by Lord and Savior, you can get baptized. That's it. I remember one of the churches that I served in a couple years ago, they were trying to find a church that had a baptismal. They couldn't find one. And they wanted the church, I understand, you want the church to be there as a joy because we all get joys when someone gets baptized in the waters and we observe it. But sometimes it may not be for you, it's for them. And one of the things I told the leaders, I said, if this group, it was a group of young adults that together wanted to be baptized, I said, we could just go to Orchard Beach and just have them baptize them in the waters, that's it. We don't need to do no special ceremony, we don't have to do a special event, we don't have to have everybody here to do it. If somebody wants to feel part of it, record it on video. Thank God for iPhones, you could record some great video on iPhones. There is no need to have a whole special service to do this if that person wants to be baptized in the waters. Glory to God if they want to be changed, new creatures. So this is what we see here, a faith that produces action. So if we go to Matthew chapter 28, verses 19 through 20, this is the call to be a disciple maker. Matthew 28, verses 19 through 20. And it reads as follows in 19. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I commanded you. And surely I am always with you to the very end of age. So breaking down those verses very quickly, you see verse 19 says, therefore, and go. Marching orders. Go out there. Meaning, don't stay in the local church. You're called to go out there and share the word of God with your family members, with friends, people you run into as you're shopping for groceries, share the gospel, be the gospel. Then it says, make disciples of all nations. That means whoever you run to, there is no racism in Christ. That's one thing we have to understand. Sometimes in our culture, there are certain cultures we dislike. It's taught behavior. We're all creatures of the Lord. We need to be able to reach those with the gospel. So that has to die to us. And then what it says next, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and of the Holy Spirit. So now we're not only called to go, 
we're not only called to make disciples, but it's not the pastor who baptizes in the name of the Holy Spirit. You notice there's no pastor there that says there. It says, therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That means you could do that. How many of you remember the story of Justin Bieber when he got baptized? Justin Bieber was in a hotel with two Christian basketball players. And a lot of people would criticize him because he was going to church, but he had not been baptized yet. And in one moment after a basketball game, they were just hanging out in the room, they were doing a Bible study, and Justin Bieber said, why can't I just be baptized now? And the two basketball players looked at themselves, and this came to mind, and they filled the tub with water, and they baptized Justin Bieber in that bathroom hotel. No special service, no whole church service glorifying. It was just two godly people with another person who wanted to be godly and holy, separate for Christ, baptized in the waters. No cameras to be putting out in a magazine or anything like that. It was a private moment between him and the Lord. And this is what we have to keep in mind. So when they asked Justin Bieber, when did you get baptized? It wasn't when he got baptized in the church. It was baptized in that hotel room. That's when he got baptized. So if we go to Matthew 14, verses 28 through 31. Matthew 14, verses 28 through 31. And it reads as follows. Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. Come, he said. Then Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water, and came toward Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid and began to sink. Cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You of little faith, he said, why did you doubt? So what do we see here? One of the reasons we see Peter walk out to the water and Keep in mind, as you read these verses, this is happening at night. This is not during the day. It's at night. There's a storm brewing. And Peter sees Jesus as he's intended, meaning the glory of Christ, the glory of the Lord. So he's out in the middle of the body of water, shining, and he's calling them out to step out in faith. And by obedience, he does step out in faith. Now, here's the thing. He's fine. The Lord is giving him the ability to walk on the water towards him as long as he keeps his eyes on him. What ended up happening, we see in those verses there, it says, when he saw the wind, he was afraid and beginning to sink and cried out, Lord, save me. He took his eyes off the Lord. He let the world distract him. And we tend to do that at times as believers. We let the world distract us. Don't let the world distract you. Keep your eyes on Christ. And we see in verse 31, immediately Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You of little faith, he said, why did you doubt? He's seen miracles performed by Christ. He's seen Christ stop storms. Yet for that moment, he doubted. For any of you who ever been on a cruise, if you ever stepped out on a cruise ship at night, it is a scary thing. It is very scary. I can understand why some people disappear on cruises. It's surprising you don't hear it as much in the news as you should, because there's a large amount of people, and especially lately, I've been noticing lately, it's been being in the news lately, people disappearing on cruise ships. Mm -hmm. And they, I have a profound respect for the ocean. I've been in storms and all kinds of stuff that, when me and my wife went on a cruise, we went to the front of the ship at night, and this scripture came to mind when I went, and I said, wow, what faith. Because I couldn't even see my hand in front of me when we did it, and I was like, what faith for him to step out. And at that moment, me and my wife looked at each other because we were at the front bow of the ship, and we were, you know, sometimes you get courageous, and sometimes you need to take wisdom. So we were very frightened, and all of a sudden we was like, we need to get inside because we don't see Jesus out there, so we might end up, you know, looking and, and tip over because the ocean can entice you. So we just stepped back and said, you know what, we're going back in. But that's what we have to keep in mind. We have to keep in our mind on Christ. And that's what we see here, that Peter took his moment, his glimpse off of Christ. So the reason Peter could walk on water was not because he wanted to write a book about walking on water or he wanted pictures of him walking on water. 
Mind you, in the Olympics recently, someone was surfing in the Olympics, and he's Christian. I'm not criticizing him, but I'm criticizing the media that made a big deal. He won the competition. When he jumped off that last wave, it literally looked like he was walking on water. He stood for a good moment in the air, straight up, up and down, like he was just floating on the waves. And the media made it a big deal. And they made it a more bigger deal once they knew he was Christian. Mm -hmm. So basically they were lifting him up instead of lifting up Christ. So we have to be careful with that. So what was Peter's motivation? He wasn't trying to seek fame. He simply wanted to go to Jesus. That should be our desire. We want to be with Christ. We should be seeking to be closer to him. And we see that Jesus pulls him out of the water and back into the boat. This means that at any moment, we can always turn back to him. Because as human beings, we're going to make mistakes. But if you repent and turn back to him, he can bring you back to him. Don't ever think that you could do something so bad that you can never come back to Christ. We're in the grace period right now that we can do that. Take advantage of that grace period and come back to him. But don't take such an advantage that you think you could do whatever you want and that you'll have time. Because here's the thing. Time is moving quickly. How many of you feel the summer went very quickly today? Oh, yeah. I feel like I blinked and the summer just went. We're in September already. I'm like, I have plans. And you guys know I... <laughs> so one thing we have to keep in mind is that we're blessed that we serve the Lord, but time is flying by that we got to make sure we're walking correctly because we could get left behind. We have to be mindful of that. Be careful. So one thing we're called to do also is remembrance. If we go to 1 Corinthians chapter 11, and we're closing here as we prepare to have Holy Communion. 1 Corinthians 11, 23 through 26. And this is written by Paul, and it says in verse 23, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And the same way after the supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is a new covenant, meaning new agreement. In my blood, do this whenever you drink it, in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So looking at those verses, why are we taking the Lord's Supper? Why are we having Holy Communion today? We're doing it in remembrance of Him. So we could realign our spirits, realign our sight, that we keep our vision on Christ, that we realize what is our identity. We are Christians. We're followers of Christ. Whenever we take Holy Communion, that's what we're saying. I'm not the old me. I'm a new creature. And it's a remembrance that you don't keep doing the things you did in the past. Now, you got to respect when you take Holy Communion. This is a holy, sanctified event that we're doing. But we're doing this in order for us to continue walking in faith in Christ. So God, the perfect son, became the fulfillment of the countless Old Testament prophecies concerning the Redeemer. When he said, do this in remembrance of me, he indicated this was a ceremony that must be continued in the future. This means that every time we take Holy Communion, we should do that as often as possible. Because we have short-term memory. How many of you admit that? We have short-term memory. We'll forget that, you know, for example, there's certain customs in the world today that they have a, a purpose. So, for example, for those who are married, you have your wedding ring, right? There's a reason why you have your wedding ring, wedding band on. To remind you, you belong to someone. You belong to your spouse. There are spouses that sometimes don't wear their wedding bands and it's with intention because they're not living married. They wanna have that freedom to do whatever they want and still have someone to come to at home. Then technically you're not married. What you're doing is violating the vows that you took to be one together as the word calls us to be. So these are things that we see. So it's indicated also that the Passover, which required the death of a lamb and looked forward to the coming of the Lamb of God, would take away the sin of the world, was fulfilled in the Lord's Supper. Meaning, 
before Christ went to die on the cross, what did he do? He had one last meal with the disciples. And he prepared them for what's to come. But he also reminded them to keep having a meal in remembrance of him. Because the struggles were going to be real. The persecution was going to be real. But as long as they had Holy Communion, they remembered why they're going through this. Because no one loved Christ. There was people that the enemy were using to try to persecute Christ. And if they did it to him, they're going to do it to us. Because if we're the image bearers of God, that means that some people are going to see us, and they're going to see Christ in us, and they're going to hate us. Because you being in a room makes them feel convicted. And it should. If you're living as Christ-like as possible, if there are sinful people around you, they should feel convicted being around you. They should feel a heart of repentance that they want to change. They want to do better. And that starts being in that atmosphere, knowing that there's a change of an environment. So wherever you're at, you should be changing the environment. You're in stop and shop. Let it be a change of environment. That if someone is deciding that they're going to steal a whole bunch of groceries off the shelves, that as soon as you walk by them, they change their mind. That through the Holy Spirit, they felt something. Remember how um, Jesus walked and somebody touched his robe? And he said, who touched my robe? Mm -hmm. And it was by faith that person who wanted to be healed was grasping at his robe. Same way, you might pass by someone and change their whole life by introducing them to Christ. Mm -hmm. So, one of the greatest blessings of our, our identity in Christ is the grace we're given in order to grow into spiritual maturity. And that reflects our new identity. Our lives in the light of our identity in Christ are filled with a heavenly father, a large loving family. We're part of the family now. We're adopted. We're grafted in. And the understanding that we're citizens of another kingdom and not of this earth. Again, I remind you, we're not citizens of the United States. We have a passport from heaven. We're citizens of heaven, and we need to have that mindset. So we can't get offended if somebody says, oh, the United States suck. We shouldn't be offended. We should be offended if anyone speaks ill against Christ. That's our identity, okay? In Philippians chapter 1, verse 6, written by Paul as well, it says, Being confident as this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. That means until he returns. When Paul wrote this, he was writing expecting that Christ was going to return in the day he was alive. That's not a negative. That's a positive. All of us should be expecting Christ to come at any day now. We should be living expecting Christ to come at any day now. Why? Because if we're living that way, we're making sure we're living holy. Because if he could come tomorrow, you want to make sure you don't miss that boat, right? How many of you ever seen the movie Left Behind? There's a great book series called Left Behind I read when I first came to the Lord, and then they made a movie. Not the new one. The old one with Kirk Cameron. Then they came out and did a, a new one with um, Nicolas Cage, which made no sense. But the older one with Kirk Cameron. Um, you don't want to be left behind. You'll be fearful if the Lord comes and takes up every believer and you fell behind. We don't want to be falling behind. We want to go with him when he comes. All right? So as the ladies come up, we're going to prepare to go into Holy Communion. We're going to stand up and we're going to pray together. We thank you, Lord. We praise your holy name, Lord. Can we praise them? Can somebody give them a praise? Are you excited serving the Lord? Aren't you happy serving the Lord? Praise the Lord. So as the ladies pray over the Holy Communion, we're going to pray together that the Lord renew our commitment. Lord, Father God, you see our hearts, you see our souls, Lord. We know we are not perfect, Lord, but that you continue to strive to make us perfect, Lord, Father God. That you help us continue to have a heart of uh, repentance, Lord. That you help us grow in your word, Lord. That you help us continue to serve you, Lord. That our faith produce action, Lord. That we disciple the next person, the other, Lord. That we live intentional lives for the others. Helping others come to know you in us, Lord, Father God. We know we are ambassadors, Lord. That you continue to help us to live righteously, Lord. That we continue to be guided by your Holy Spirit, Lord, Father God. We thank you for this time as we gather together, fellowshipping together. And as we prepare to break and have Holy Communion together. 
We thank you for this time together that you forgive us of our sins. In Jesus' name we all say, Amen. 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 And as the sisters pass Holy Communion, thank you. Hallelujah. We thank you, Jesus. We praise your holy name. We thank you, Father God. And remember, anyone who accepts Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior can take Holy Communion. And if you've been baptized in the waters, we praise you, Lord. Hallelujah. No, it's okay. It's okay. We thank you, Lord. We praise your holy name, Lord, Father God. We thank you, Jesus. We praise you, Lord. Hallelujah, hallelujah. And for those who don't know, the top layer, you just gently peel up top. You have the bread, and then the second layer is the wine. So we'll peel the first half, which is the bread. And we'll go into 1 Corinthians 11, 23. For I received from the Lord what I also passed to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took the bread. And when he given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So we'll take of the bread, give thanks to the Lord, break, and consume. We thank you, Jesus. We thank you, Lord. We praise your holy name, Lord. We thank you for your sacrifice, Lord. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. We drink of the cup. We thank you, Lord. We praise you, Lord. We thank you for this time together, Lord. As we do this in remembrance of you and know that your time to return is sooner than ever, Lord, Father God. That you continue to guide us through your Holy Spirit, Lord. That we continue to be image bearers, Lord. That we be a great witness. In Jesus' name we pray. And we all say, Amen. Amen.